we're now at CML. That is, what's the C stand for? Chronic. Uh, yeah. So, um, and it is about 20% of adult leukemia. So, you know, it's, it's mainly in um, the adult leukemia group. And then there's about 22 to chromosome 9. And I don't care that you know those numbers, but just know that it's it's a goofed up chromosome situation, that they're, they're switched. And so that's that's what's causing uh, the problem. And they and, and it, it involves BCR slash ABL. If you ever have to look that up in your drug book, it'll say that that's the target is the BCR ABL, which is it's an oncogene that, that um, can initiate the malignancy. Um, and if, if, if that BCR able gets turned on, then what we want to do is turn it off so that that, um, that, that can, can uh, really, really help the, um, the patients that have the CML now. It's, it's part of the therapy to really, really break through the CML. It's, it's, it's really an amazing breakthrough. Um, and it says that it may, the, the biggest risk may be that um, large doses of ionizing radiation, but otherwise they, they don't really know besides the, the chromosome or what, what might, might uh, turn the oncogene on like that. So anyway, there, there are um, several phases of this. Uh, the chronic phase is when it's, it's called indolent. When you see indolent, that means it's slow and quads along, and, but then um, it, it's just progressing very slowly. And there may be all symptoms, or maybe none at all. The only thing you may know is that you've got the, some, some abnormality in your bone marrow, and you've got the Philadelphia chromosome that, um, that you may just really not even realize that you, that you have it. Um, and it, uh, it can be responsive to standard treatment, and they're, they're usually less than 10% blast cells. Uh, what are blast cells? Mm -hmm. Mature white mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right way immature, aren't they? They're way to the what side? Left. 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 Yes, they're way to the left. So they're leaning away over there on the left side. So, okay. And um, you can tell on just r routine lab tests that, and the anemia and, and uh, all that. And they can have fatigue and dyspnea on exertion and they can also have some splenomegaly because the, some of the, the cells are, are being being trapped in there. Um, they're, they're abnormal and the body's trying to get rid of the ones that are abnormal, but it is not, not really successful. Okay, then we go to accelerated phase, and that's 10 to 30 percent blast cells. You don't have to memorize this, just know that it goes, it, it goes indolent and then, then it starts to rev up some more, and I don't think that's that necessary that you know those percents, but y'all always ask me all these specific questions, so I'm just telling you just so, just so you'll have it if you want to know. So, but just realize that it, it, it gets chronic, accelerated, and then it does involve more blast cells as it accelerates. That's really what, what the, um, the point is. So um, then you, you have the, the blast phase, and then that's the, you've got your rapid cell proliferation and the metabolism of the, those cancer cells um, really revs up and starts, starts taking more from the body. And uh, so there's more fatigue, more weight loss, and sweating, and heat intolerance, all this kind of thing, uh, because of that increased um, metabolism, metabolic needs of all those black cells trying to, to turn it off from the other So, uh, and then you've got the yeah, <coughs> the platelets are being crowded out, and of course they're going to their media. So any kind of bleeding, bruising, fatigue guy, all those kind of things. And then it, it evolves to um, an aggressive leukemia, and the um, the greater than 30% uh, um, blast, and then it goes goes even even higher than that, and they call that term of the very last stage is the terminal blast crisis, and um, so that that it can go into skin, lymph nodes, bones, CNS, if, um, because people can have it. You can actually do a spinal tap um, to to. To check the, the uh, cerebrospinal fluid and see what um, the blood muscle cells in, in the cerebrospinal fluid. So, and, um, and that's, that's a survival of only two to four months once it gets to that final blood crisis. It's just that it will not, even though you've got cells turning over quickly, it does not respond to therapy. At this point. So, so that's the bad news because it is not, at, at this point, it's not really. Um, 
but it's not often curable. And unless maybe bone marrow transplant. When I get to bone marrow transplant, it remind me to tell you about my CML personal that I knew that it makes me want to cry every time I think about it. Um, so we're going to go back to another acute. We're going to go back go to the lymphocytic. And that's the kind that's most common in population. And younger adults. Um, so y'all so the, um, it is, there's B cells in 80% and, and, um, and T cells in 20% of the cases. So the, the, uh, the B cells do what? Antibodies. Antibodies. Antibodies, exactly. And then the T cells do, do the, the, which kind of immunity? Cellular, cellular immunity. right. So cellular and humoral immunity. So, so anyway, we're, we're more dealing with the humoral immunity um, cells with this. And again, that, that's not necessarily something you just differentiate, but just, just so you know, because that's a, that's a statistic that if you want to know that, that's, that's fine. Um, and it is a, a real rapid onset, and uh, it's a lymphoblast um, are, are going like crazy in the bone marrow. And then we're, we're going to see, of course, elevated what? When we do a CBC. WBCs can be way up there. So, um, and then we do we do combination therapies to, to produce the, the remission. So, um, ALL is the most common leukemia in, in children as well as just the, the biggest cause of cancer death in children. Um, and you don't really see it in adults until, until later. It really kind of skips a, a, a beat. That could, you could have it in, in other people in, in, that, in that interval. But, but um, uh, late middle age and, and then the risk increases with, with age, probably from um, exposure to more chemicals and that sort of thing. It's not quite with the children, though. But the lymph cells are immature lymphocytes. We've already said that the last lymph the last, and they, and they don't function well. So um, if somebody says, uh, well, what do my white like blood cells do? What would we tell the patient? Right in right the infection. Well, what have we got? Like we were saying yesterday, 64,000 white blood cells. And you said, what do those white blood cells do? Oh, they fight infection. So <laughs> well, I must really be able to fight infection now. No. Is that true? Yeah, they're immature and they're not doing anything for nothing except they're just taking up space. They get all the needs from the rest of the cells and they're taking what they can get. And just like that, the resident was saying in the movie yesterday, cancer talks, it just doesn't die. It just takes what it wants and it just won't die. And of course, the lax ones didn't die even in the new culture. So, anyway, um, I think you know about the crowding and all that sort of thing. But um, with, when it does infiltrate to the central nervous system, which it certainly can, uh, what kind of what kind of side of, or what kind of effects might you see, or what kind of symptoms might you see if it's if the uh, if there's rapidly proliferating cells in the CNS? Headaches. Yeah, headaches. What are we all saying up here? Headaches. <laughs> well, anyway, what did you say, Robin? Yeah, they could be, they could lose their balance. Yeah, they could be balance problems. And, and what, what about like the cranial nerve function and other things? They really ought to be your senses could be messed up, couldn't they? So, and um, especially vision, though, because of the pressure on the eyes and all. And then vomiting, that tumor sensitive syndrome, if there's edema in the in the central nervous system, uh, then, then there can be, be nausea and vomiting. And uh, sometimes that can be the first sign um, is, is nausea and vomiting that you can't really explain uh, in somebody that's, you know, doesn't have fever and stuff with it. It's just, just nausea and vomiting that, that it, it may be um, brain metastasis or, or infiltration of um, abnormal cells to the, um, to the brain. I mean, like it, with any kind of cancer, the brain metastasis of like lung cancer or whatever. And then there's 80 to 90 percent rates of, of complete remission. So what, what does remission really mean? So the symptoms are gone, but what, what else do you have to see that it's gone? What to say that they're in remission? What, are you gonna, what test would you do? Well, what? Where are the blood cells made? They're so bone marrow. Exactly. Bone 
exactly. That's really the that tells you that that's that's the signal that, that it is um, in remission when you don't have any in the bone marrow. Is if they're not in the blood, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're they're all gone in the bone marrow. They may be just sitting there stored, not not being released yet, or they're, they're not enough to count or something. So anyway, um, most people have, or a lot of people have advanced disease when they're diagnosed. I want to say something about the CNS thing too. Um, you know, talking about dizziness and balance and all that kind of thing. And what what would you think if um, if you go in, into into the room and somebody's been very very alert and oriented and very peppy and, and talking to you and you've never seen any disorientation or, or problems or anything and, and you go in there and and they they start. You, it's difficult to arouse them, or they're they're not um, they're not talking like they normally do, and they're just they and you have and you look at their drug sheet and and you see well they haven't had an opioid or anything. This is kind of looking like they're kind of in a scooper or they're drunk or whatever. And, and um, so so that you do need to look at some subtle um, um, mental status, like altered mental status, a level of consciousness changes that. That are not explained, but you know there, that's the whole thing that's so, so hard about this because there's so many other things that could cause that, right? I, you know, they're, they're um, especially medications because in the hospital, we found patients get a lot of medications, or if they're taking chemotherapy, um, or if they've got an infection and they're um, you know not feeling well and they've got a fever, that can make you sort of delirious sometimes. So so um, you know when you've got to really watch for subtle subtle changes and. and um, once the fever comes down and once the infection's cleared and they're still not not doing well, then they may need to, to have what done. <coughs> well, you don't, since it's circulating cells, you may not, it's not going to be like a tumor because it has to be a tumor as big as around your little finger. How would you tell if there's abnormal um, cells in, in your central nervous system? Oh, the, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So we would have to do, take take some of the sweeter style fluid out, and then um, and, and check those those cells and see if see if they're having any pressure. So they're just patients are not just to the um, the CDC. You want to look at the and, and their temperature and all that kind of thing. You want to definitely look at at their at their level of consciousness and that. That really goes for all cancers that can spread to the brain too. I mean, that's that's not the only thing, but but it can be more subtle with with leukemia with all the other things that they're going through. So, okay, so now we are going to go to another uh, lymphocyte or lymphatic cancer, which is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So, so this is immature what? Lymphocyte. Yeah, from that lymphocyte cell line. And so um, it, it's a chronic, so, so is it aggressive or indolent? Indolent. Yeah, that word, you hear that word a lot in, in um, like history and physical. You may see that, so I want you to know what that means. So um, it, it, it is in, in adults over 50, and the other chronic was like that too, right? So that's not anything that, that you um, that would be difficult to remember. But it, it says that most... Most cases are around 65, but um, that's this, it's more likely to start at age over 50. And um, it is the about a third of, of all of the, um, I'm not saying it here, I can't read my writing here. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, it, it is the, the, um, the most common of the of the major leukemia. So anyway, um, you're going to see the, the red blood cells. What are, what's going to happen with those? Decrease. Yeah, and then um, and possible recurrent infections. This one seems to be. There are some people that have CLM that that have problems with their immunity, um, and they end up. Have, we've had a lot of CLM patients, so we had to give that intravenous immune globulin. Because um, because they they just were not making antibodies. It does say recurring infections there, doesn't it? After the anemia infection, 
they have just continual infections, then we know that their immune system is really not working. And, and we really do give a, a lot of people monthly or every couple of months um, immune globulin to give them somebody else's antibodies. What kind of immunity do you call that when you're using artificial somebody else's antibodies? Yeah, passive and, and artificial. It's not yours. You're, you're borrowing it from somebody else. And so, but, that, but that really does make a difference in the um, infection level you can give them um, antibodies. An aggregate from, um, from healthy people, hopefully in the healthy, that don't know their healthy. So this is where they, they can't have advanced disease and diagnosis. And if, if they do, then they only live about 19 months, even though that's still slow growing. Um, they may just not even realize that they had anything wrong. Maybe they just think I'm getting old, you know, and I just am not going to have as much energy, and they just don't know that that's what's going on with them until, until it's too late to to really make a bunch of difference. But the 19 months is the average sur survival time it, it, with advanced disease. But if, if you catch it early, and a lot of times that may be just be on a normal physical, that they, they may catch the abnormal CDC. And then um, that you can, die, live, you can live over 10 years um, at that, at that point. So if it's a, if it's a uh, early stage. So, okay, and I think we said this the other day, but Leukemia is diagnosed 10 times more often in adults than it is in children, even though it is the most common cancer in children. That means children don't get cancer a whole lot, right? When it, what's the biggest risk factor for cancer? Age. Yeah, age. age. That, that's absolutely right. Yeah, so just, just remember that. That is something that you, um, you, you need to keep in mind because um, most of the patients that we have in our practice were, were elderly. You, you saw some, some younger adults, but that's just much. Um, and we don't really understand the, the causes of leukemia. Of course, the uh, Philadelphia chromosomes with that chronic um, uh, myelosis. But um, the ionizing radiation um, and, and infectious agents, or like viruses, possibly, um, and chemicals and some some drugs, especially exposure to chemotherapy drugs. Um, you know, talking about when, when we were in 112 with the cellular unit, we talked about that. Um, that there is a, there are late effects from having radiation and chemotherapy, and some of those late effects are actually um, the second cancers because um, that that can those alkalinity agents in particular, that's cytotoxic yeah, that's cytotoxic drugs, absolutely, and they fix um, the cyclophosphamide um, or cytoxin, like the one that I had, had um, asked y'all to, to learn about. We, they, we use that in a whole lot of different and when we were um, prepping people to have a um, bone marrow transplant, they used a lot of cyclophosphamide um, in, in that. And I'm not sure if they still do or not, but that was an alkylating agent is, is what they use a lot of times. And so so, um, so that's that's a, a, a definite risk factor is to have had um, prior exposure to alkylating agents. I actually saw, I didn't see many people transform into loop um, or have a, a transformation from, from cyclophosphamide um, maybe, maybe once or twice, but, but some of the, um, the oral agents um, that they can take um, chronically, that, that can end up causing the leukemias in the end up. That's some, some of the ones that um, seem to be the, the worst for some of the oral agents that they took for years. So, so anyway, but it, it certainly can can be a risk. And then the, there's genetic factors, which we're not even sure about, but except for the Philadelphia chromosome, and then the um, people that are immunodeficient. You know, we talked about um, the, the little boy in the bubble that I, I told you about um, in the other other course, that um, he ended up dying of lymphoma. A lot of times immunodeficient um, people can, um, can get lymphomas, but they, they can't have um, leukemias too. They're very, very closely related. To, to separate um, some of the, like the CLL and certain kinds of lymphoma are almost the same. You can actually biopsy a lymph node and see abnormal cells in a lymph node and call it lymphoma, but, but if you had actually done a bone marrow test first, you would have called it leukemia just because of where you did the biopsy. So, so there, there are um, some of the lymphocytic um, leukemias and, and uh, lymphomas that are very, very closely related, and it just depends on where you do the, the first test. So, um, anyway, the, usually, I think we, we talked about this in 112, is that a lot of cancers are multifactorial, so that means 
lots of things are happening. Lots of, um, you know, we, um, our cells do have like a spell check on the computer, and um, their immune system um, is, is, is supposed to be tagging those and, and uh, for destruction. And um, I want to go back to interferon. I, a lot of people are just not understanding interferon. <laughs> but um, interferon actually um, uh, normally fights viruses in our body, but um, we can um, can use other well, interferon and other kinds of um, immune uh, modulators in our body, like interleukins. There are several different interferons that our body makes, with lots and lots and lots of interleukins, and um, those can can tag those abnormal cells. Once that spell check on the computer calls in the troops, then, then that's what's supposed to happen: is that those interferons and all signal um, the, the immune system and the macrophages and all to come in and, and eat up those, those boogers that we don't want to be um, in our body. So um, anyway, that's that's really what that any of those um, immunotherapies do, is it somehow flags those abnormal cells um, for the immune system, for the other, for like the, the gobblers to, to eat it up. Or for the for our antibodies, some sometimes there there may be some antibodies to to certain kinds of abnormal cells, especially if you um, if develop antibodies to a virus or something like that. So we talked about what is related to to leukemia, which what other chromosomal disease? Down, Down syndrome. Down syndrome. Down. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> and, um, the high risk for, for getting um, ALS. Um, in children or adults. And there, there are some people um, in some racial and ethnic groups that have worse outcomes than, than others. Um, identical siblings of, of leukemic patients are, are much, at much higher risk of developing leukemia. And um, that, the, the interesting thing, I guess, would be is if they're living in the same environment versus a different environment. You know, you hear about these studies with twins separated and burned, and so what about the environmental factors that might have might play into um, the exposures, like if it is chemical work exposures. I was actually doing a demonstration on Friday with, um, I don't know what that means, last name is, which is chemistry um, instructor Call here. Them. What's her name? Call Oh, Call. Okay. Now, I, I just didn't catch her last name, and her, her name tag was turned around, so I never did so ask her last name. But anyway, she was saying that um, in this building, that we are using more power than, than any other building on campus. And it's because of all the, the hoods and everything that run all the time, and uh, all the fans. And so, so um, Amy and and um, I think Dusty, um, the same that's a building manager here, and I think it was Lene Wallace, the biology teacher. Um, I don't think she she works with real toxic um, biologic agents in her classes, does she, Lene? I don't I don't know. If she, I think she does more general biology. She has specimens and things like that that need to be refrigerated. Of course, we have a lot of refrigerators and all that. But, but Amy said, um, said you know what? I've I've just got I've just got leukemia in a box here, and it's in this. Um, and so we're not going to no no. I cannot turn my fans off because it, it, she's using all these kind of toxins and everything in, in the labs that um, for her chemistry class and, that, and the benzene and all that kind of thing. And so you know that's that's not she's she's wanting to. To protect y'all, and I'm so glad they asked. Though I didn't, you know, that'd be awful if they if they just decided, just oh, we'll just cut the fans off at night, and maybe didn't even know it. You know, <laughs> cut them off, come when the when the security guard comes in or something. No, can't do that with the, those kind of agents because they'll they'll end up sucking into the the regular um, flow of our um, HVAC system, our um, ventilation system, and and they will all be breathing it. So so she's protecting us all. So we'll have to thank Amy next time we sit here. So. Anyway, um, so if if, um, if a baby has been exposed or a fetus has been exposed to radiation um, um, before it's born, then that, that can certainly um, predispose to leukemia and outbreaking agents, like we said. Um, and that's a non-lymphocytic leukemia. I don't know why they have to say non, but that means it is a myelocytic, not a lymphocytic. So um, anyway, um, the, 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 I've already said this. You remember talking about that nitrogen mustard too? Mm -hmm. That that's where cytoxin came from. That's how you how um, they they discovered that it would be um, a cell toxin uh, for for actually therapeutic use rather than just a um, you know, chemical warfare kind of thing. That's what that's what it really started out being. So so I guess 
don't want to say war is our friend, but sometimes good things can happen from something that's terrible going on. But, but that, that's what happened with, uh, especially leukemia treatment. Um, it actually caused leukemia, and, and radiation certainly can cause leukemia as well. But they, they, um, the doctors could, could tell with the nitrogen muster, what it was doing was affecting, it was decreasing blood cell production. So I'm like, well, maybe if it's decreasing blood cell production in normal people, <coughs> what would it do if, if we give it to people that have abnormal um, proliferation of cells? And, and, uh, and it did work. It played out. So, so anyway, that's that's really kind of where it came from. I think we kind of, you know, remember that little picture that had the, you know, smells like, what, it smells like horseradish or something? Why not? And that was it, that little, little picture that showed you from World War One, I think, whatever that was in the <coughs> about five years, five to eight years after treatment before you have to really worry about those kind of leukemia developing because of chemotherapy. Okay, I think we've talked about a, a lot of this um, already. <laughs> Cigarette smoking has been associated even with leukemia and a chemical such as benzene and um, that's in gasoline and, and uh, cigarette smoke. That's why it's not good for pregnant women to be inhaling gasoline fumes. I tried to stay away when I was pregnant with uh, third child, I was getting gasoline with him and, and um, you know, I was trying to kind of stay a little away so I wouldn't be inhaling the, the fumes. And this guy right beside me lights a cigarette. Oh, oh my God. He's going to count it. Kill us all, you know. HTLV, have y'all heard of that one? The human T cell leukemia lymphoma virus one, which that's not something that you see very often, but but uh, we may have some of those floating around in our system. You know, I told you that there were quadrillions of viruses in our whole in our our body at any one time. Quadrillions, um, besides all the other bacteria and fungal, fungal cells and everything, um, we've got more uh, foreign cells in our body than. But anyway, um, that is a retrovirus. What's another retrovirus you studied about recently? Yeah, that's another one. Yeah, that is another one that can be respected. Okay, I think we really talked about this is really sort of a review. We've already talked about all of those things happening. Mm -hmm. metabolism, with the site destruction, and, and all that. And, and with that, if, uh, if you're taking that chemotherapy with those 64,000, white cells and, and um, they, they're they rapidly pr being produced but they're rapidly being destroyed by the chemotherapy. What, what's our emergency we have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we got, we got potassium, high potassium, right? And hypochloric acid, phosphate. Yeah. What does that do? What does that do to your um, what to our filtration system and everything? Yeah. What does it do to the kidneys? The uric acid. Yeah. 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 Um, dying at that time. That, this is really a bad one to call it that. But we know that, and so we can do what? We can, we can, yeah, we can, we can be proactive, can't we? Mm -hmm. We can be preventive by the, using the hydration and the what else? Uric acid. What's it going to do? Uric acid, right. It gets through the uric acid. So we got our hydration and, and our um, allopurinol. And what's another thing that you can do? We got. When you have acid, what do you, what you want to do to the acid? Yeah, alkalinization. Yeah, you can use um, um, sodium bicarbonate. You actually take it in pills, but you can take it up there with you know, the things that are necessary to do so. Um, and oh, I didn't really mention about the other um, uh, intracranial kind of situations, too. We talked about the level of consciousness. and but if, there is increased intracranial pressure. Like so, so if you do a lot of 
lumbar puncture, that's another name for it. The spinal tap. If you do a lumbar puncture, um, they can actually measure the pressure that's in the central nervous system. So there may be uh, in increased intracranial pressure, and you can tell that from, from the, the way the little um, gauge goes up um, uh, when, when they actually get into the, the uh, spinal canal. So uh, to, to get to where the, the, uh, the fluid is in there, the spinal tap is in there. <laughs> and then it's, uh, it's under pressure, it, it's going to show you on, on that little gauge. And so that's something that would be uh, very disturbing to a doctor doing that, um, doing a, that the lumbar puncture and seeing that pressure go way up there, like, oh, okay, this person's really in trouble. So, um, so that's, that's a way to, to tell that. Um, and then we can actually have infiltration of the kidneys, not, not just from that uric acid situation, all that. You can actually have kidney problems before you ever um, take any. So that, that makes it very difficult to tolerate treatment, doesn't it? So you can't, the kidneys aren't working well to begin with, you may have to have um, some, some dialysis to, to begin with to be able to, to filter everything out. Um, so we have some pressure out there and increased what? What are our two things that they can be with? We've got yeah. problems with kidney function, our two labs. We've got a lot of Looking up all the lab stuff, we've had some several people go to dialysis. Um, well, from my view, and we just had a lot of dialysis patients this semester, so I think a lot of y'all have gotten to, to see that that process. Okay, um, and what's going to happen when we have our increased metabolism? What happens? That we, well, what? Yeah, our lab regulates our metabolism. Our thyroid. We have high thyroid. So the heat tolerance, weight loss, and the, um, the, the increase, what, what vital signs increase? Heart rate and, and maybe blood pressure too. So, yeah, so that's the kind of things that you'll see if there's that hypermetabolism going on as well. You, it'll, it'll look like it's, um, it's a thyroid issue. And so they may take what, what, value, what um, blood tests would they do to check your thyroid if, if the person came in with those symptoms and so they didn't know that is how you tell remission? Bone marrow. Bone marrow, right, right. And then um, we have to do our diagnostic test to make sure we know what we're doing with it. And we, uh, why do we use uh, combination therapy most of the time for chemo? Cells, like, yeah, they do get the same. Right, the different parts of the cell cycle. And then, you know, like some of them they're saying those alkylating agents do not, they are not cell cycle specific. But then, um, some of the ones um, hit the mitosis part, and some of them hit the the, um, the, the synthesis of the, the DNA synthesis part. And so, so if you, and, and what, what are we trying to to stagger as far as um, nadir? Nadir, nadir, exactly. Yeah. So, what does nadir mean? The lowest point of where your Yeah, the lowest point of where your your um, white blood cells or platelets would be within any cycle. Yeah. So. Well, I'm impressed at y'all that word because that's not something you probably knew before, did you? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so that, that was a retained from what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, there is, I know you've got, some people probably have different brands of lab books or different blood companies or whatever, but um, the diagnostic test section that has talks about bone marrow um, biopsies and all are, are, will be good in your, um, in your lab book, but I saw um, in the hematology section on, um, in Iggy, pages 866 and 867, it really has a good explanation there about what the nursing considerations and everything, too. And I, I think I had y'all read that last time, didn't I? About the, yeah, so y'all had already read that section. But, um, but go back and look at that because that's, that really does tell you what's going on with, um, with uh, bone bearing. Uh, and, uh, anyway, what? What are we going to have to do to, or what has to be done before somebody has um, something invasive like that where they're either going to go, wait, or where's the bone marrow taken out? 
the top of the ilias first. Or they usually do biopsies, you're right, and it's much more helpful to have the biopsy when you're trying to look for leukemia or look for whether um, somebody's in remission or not. So, so the iliac crest will be your, your main part. What, what's something that we need to make sure has, has been done before anybody sees that meeting? And they would do their own um, bone marrow test um, on the floor. They would, and they want those those uh, residents to be able to get practice in doing that instead of sending them down to the lab for pathologists to do like they do at James doing it out of the, the hip and, and actually taking a biopsy of, of actually bone marrow tissue, um, a big, that gives you more uh, to, to look at and, and it's more accurate as to what your diagnosis is. But um, it, it really, you do have to use um, an anesthetic um, to, to uh, numb the area. And there, there is a field of questions. Really kind of these little bitty pathologists sometimes little bit of ladies that are pathologists or residents doing, doing that. They sometimes have to just, just stand up um, near the get, get on the bed with them and actually push the push the needle in there because it's really it's hard to, to puncture sometimes. It, and it looks just very brutal. But you remember the little Janice that was in the Charlie Brown thing I showed you in one twelve mm -hmm. and um and uh, they were asking her about <coughs> they were talking about taking blood out of her finger, which I doubt they were making it out of her finger. But um but she said she said what hurt? The bone no, 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 right, yeah. yeah. So and my grandmother had bone you know, just over and over and over again. She actually had long and strong macroglobulin anemia, which is like a multiple mile on the Um and yeah, so she had had lots and lots of bone marrows. She said it never really bothered her, but you know, I think a lot of people are, are uncomfortable with the pressure part. She just wants to have a high pain tolerance. But anyway, I do I do want you to, I've got lots and lots of busy stuff on this slide, I found there are this, this notes notes page for the, the collaboration, how did I do, I'll, I'll just been flipping, flipping, I'm still on this this notes page, sorry, my thumb gets wild here, um, but I do want you to know this drug back, and I, I think I've already told you that, didn't I? I do want you to know about the Gleevec, and if you go on to that, um, the, the sheet that I had with the, um, chemotherapy classifications. It's, it actually is it under the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Let's see, where is it? It's under um, that map. Here it is. It's at the bottom of the page. It is under targeted therapies. Um, Gleevec given um, PO treatment, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor is used for chronic myelogenous leukemia and GI stromal tumors. But it actually is something that, that um, helps to, the tyrosine kinase increases growth, and so you want to inhibit that, that signal that tyrosine kinase sends to the cell to, uh, to continue growth. And that, that's how that one, that one works. That's what I want you to, to know about. 
It's an information relating enzyme in cytoplasm of the cell that can signal abnormal cell division with the BCR slash ABL chromosome abnormality, which I don't care if you're about BCR ABL, whatever, but if it is a chromosomal abnormality, it's that it's really going to tremendous, tremendous advantage for people with um, listening now. Um, they, they've been able to, to just pretty much live a normal life for years with this. And it, it's just been, and it doesn't have that, that awful many side effects either. It's just, it's really amazing. And we already talked about the interferon and what that does. They do use that in leukemia a lot of times too. But this one actually is just for chronic myelocytic leukemia. So, anyway, um, we talked about the, the culmination of chemo with the nadir and all that, but it does help to reduce drug resistance and all that, too, um, in the cell cycle. We already got that for out of Okay, so we, we um, have the different, different phases of, of um, chemotherapy with that induction. is the high doses that, that, that eradicates the leukemia cells from the, the marrow really, really quickly and they give it over about seven days. They do some of it continuous infusion. Um, and I'm not going to make you room really for all those drugs because that's not good. It's always, you all believe if you're not going to use it, you're not going to remember it except for the test anyway. And then you don't really need that if you're not, if you're not a chemo nurse right now. But anyway, um, it, it, it can, though, damage the stem cells and interfere with normal blood cell production, which leukemia is already inter interfered with to begin with, right? It's already not in great shape. But then, um, you know, now, now it's in, in really bad shape. I'm sorry. I'm going to get finished with this, this one page. Now, I think, right? but, um, uh, anyway, only the dividing cells are affected. The dividing cells are affected. So that's still, that's still a lot of things. What are our human dividing cells that divide real frequently? Skin. Yes, skin. Hair. Yeah, hair. hair. And of course, the blood cells. We just said that. And we hair. Yes, definitely. So, any of, any of those, any, anything in the GI tract, pretty much, but mucous membranes all over the body as well. So, so um, that's where you get your, your side effects. So, um, we we do have to, to use um, the colony stimulating factors to rescue the marrow after the infection therapy, and try to get especially the what are the first line of defense against infection? Which kind of blood cell? Neutrophils. Right, right. That's why we do the A and C and all that. that absolute neutrophils. You to see if you're ready to take more people <coughs> or that you've recovered from the previous chemotherapy. Um, and they used to think that that might be dangerous to use those because it might might increase the growth of abnormal cells, but they found out that that's not true. But for years we didn't use it in hemologic cancers for the you know, after the therapy. So they had to do lots of research to make sure that it was safe and then it is. Um, but do you remember that bone pain is a side effect? You can have bone pain because of the people because you're packing the marrow with those abnormal cells. But you can when you're packing them with normal red blood cells that you're using like lymphocyte stimulating agents, or if you're you're doing the granulocyte colony stimulating agents agents and um, that can pack the marrow and um, between the time that the production is going on and it's released into the bloodstream, there can be a little bit of a lag and some people can have really tremendous bone pain. We had to give people opioids for it before. We try to do the, usually the anti-inflammatories work the best for that, but for some people they have to have it in the anti-inflammatories and the, um, the opioids. Um, and they can, they can have um, fingers and chills and anorexia and muscle aches and liver Symptoms, especially the Lucon, the, um, the G, GMCSF that does the macrophages too, that it can make people have abdominal pain and all kinds of things. So it's, I hated that drug, it made people feel so bad. But anyway, um, it takes about two to three weeks for the um, recovery of the bone marrow function after after a treatment, and it depends on the person. Some people it takes it much longer, but uh, um, in the in that particular period, there there can be life threatening in, infections. Um, that, um, you, even if you give the colony stimulating factors, there's still a lag um, sometimes with the, the production. With the production, you can see that um, the, it destroys those those cells quicker than they can reproduce. And so you have to keep them in for 
protective isolation in, in most situations. And, um, so, you know, we'll see. Um, of course, we have you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and, and uh, mouth sores, and liver and kidney, and cardiac toxicity. The red drugs, um, the, and they're called anth anthracyclines, that they, um, they, Adrian Lyson is doing one of them, and, and um, there's Donna, Donna Mice and Donna Rubison um, is, is what they use more for leukemia. But the, the ones that are red are usually the ones that can cause heart attack toxicity. Maybe not the only ones, but that's when you see the red one, you can kind of associate with the heart. What did you say? And your hair. And your hair. Yes, that's a really good separated in the other book. Um, they just call it post-remission chemotherapy. Well, they, when they do that first seven-day course, then the one that's after, the next course after that is, is called consolidation. Um, or there, there may be several courses as, as part of the induction, but when they consider that induction is over with and the bone marrow has doesn't have much left in it, then, or you don't really see, see anything, um, but yet you know that it's likely to come back and just have data knowing that it, if you don't just do more and then do it for longer, then it's, it's going to come back and it's completely keen. So they call it consolidation in a lot of places. So they may use the same regimen again and maybe a little bit lower doses um, and, or they may use a different combination to, to, um, um, during that early remission period to try to go for cure, not just for remission. Because that's really all you're getting with injection is remission, but not, not um, the cure. So you're, you're actually going for the cure to, to scour the, the body for, for any particular, any um, any stray cell that didn't need to be there, the, anything that's going to be abnormal and could possibly divide and cause more problems. So you want to get every last cell um, that you didn't didn't get with, from an induction. So um, and, and sometimes at that point they will do. Um, a bone marrow transplant at that particular time when they've got the remission and then they'll be the bone marrow transplant to totally wipe out the, the potential to, to make blood cells for a while until they rescue it and put the treatment. And then maintenance um, can be given for months to years, especially if they go out and take a female and keep the prolongs if they can uh, to maintain the remission and um, after the induction and consolidation. And it's milder than the induction therapy. It might be in the world also. It could be for about two to five years. Uh, but it, not all um, leukemia types need to, to have maintenance therapy, especially with the, um, the, the uh, chronic ones because they, they aren't growing so fast and they, they may be able to just, as soon as, as they start having symptoms, they, they can just stop, start treatment again in some cases. But, but um, that CML with the green that it's, it's just been wonderful. And they, they, they do take it pretty um, consistently until it stops working. And they've got some other targeted therapies with the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, that some some um, newer ones that, that can take over if the, if the Gleevex starts to fail. So, oh, jabber, jabber, jabber. But anyway, let's, let's um, anyway, with, um, with CLL, um, that in a, this is just a thing, you know, that, that these can vary, but this is just another way of, you know, just a reminder of where, where the parameters can be on this panel. The standard chemotherapy can treat but not cure CLL, um, initiate the therapy based on the, the symptoms and the activity of the disease, and it's usually some kind of alkylating agent, but it may be, um, it may be oral, um, like chlorambucil or leucoman is that the, the uh, other name for it. They might use cycl cyclophosphamide on ID. They, you can get that one orally too. Um, and they use prednisone a lot for, for the CLL treatment. That's part of the therapy because it does change the, the cellular environment and the, the way that it, it divides. And it decreases inflammation that, can, that cancer can cause too, of course. And then the crystalline or the blastin, that's a, the mitotic inhibitor. You don't really have to remember all those names, but it is that it's working in a different part of the cell cycle, or is it, it is working in a particular part of the cell cycle, and what the core divides, and the cytoxin is not cell cycle specific. Uh, we talked about interferon from interleukins modifying the body's response to cancer cells so with the flag interferon structure. Um, and let's see, you might have therapy like, like the Tuxa now. Um, NAB 
be any time it says MAB, it's a monoclonal antibody that isn't targeted to the therapy. Um, and then it, it goes for, for T cells and uh, certain kinds of T cells. And let's see here. And the um, interferons respond to um, antigens such as viruses, which, like I said a while ago, and they especially use that as CML. They may use that in addition to glue that in some cases. But the flu like symptoms and all that, if y'all learned that before, but remember that because uh, that's, uh, that's um, important to know that it, it does make people feel that. And then use it for more, um, um, melanoma and, and uh, kidney cancers and things like that, too. And then there's a whole lot more targeted therapies under investigation. It's just, I think it's really going to revolutionize cancer care. And then the, the um, complementary therapies, it's not something that really helps leukemia a whole lot. It's, I mean, as far as you, you wouldn't do that by itself because if your cells are still growing, um, no, no amount of massage or acupuncture is going to kill those bad cells. So it has to be complementary, not, not something that's totally alternative. So, so um, being able to cope with the, the therapy um, and learn to relax and use um, imagery that hypnosis can help um, as with pain and especially with this oral discomfort that the acute leukemia treatment is really, really bad on the mouth and, and throat and it's, it's painful enough to require Opioid sometimes with mouth work. So anyway, there I've got some charts listed on the notes page that you, you can look at for for Evie. Yeah, uh, she's got some really really good ones. Okay, and we can use the radiation therapy. It does damage cellular DNA and keeps and makes the cells not be able to divide and multiply. Some of them die immediately, and some of them um, take a little longer to die. But you, you don't get the maximum effect from radiation until. Probably a, a, a month or two after the, the therapy is totally finished. Uh, and then the bone marrow transplant, that's our that's our big meat of this, this, this discussion. Um, and it can be called hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Um, and, and you can actually do it um, without having to take the bone marrow out now. The bone marrow transplant is where, where it all started from, getting the, the stem cells from somebody else and, and then infusing it into the the um, recipient and then, then it grafts into the um, recipient's bone marrow and then and they, they can make um, new normal cells. And anyway, it is the treatment of choice for some types of leukemia, especially in remission after the induction therapy like the, like the ALL. And a lot of children do, do have bone marrow transplants. Um, and we do have <coughs> allogeneic and autologous. And then we also have syngeneic, which is the, the Identical twin, but allogeneic means it's from an unrelated, um, somewhat tissue match donor. It's not going to be 100% tissue match, that HLA, the human leukocyte antigen that, um, that's on, on cells um, and tissue is then that. Um, if, if, you, if it's, it's almost a match, then that's, that, you know, they, you, that's what an allogeneic is. And autologous means that you, you save up your own and then uh, on your own bone marrow. And, 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 um, and have it, it infused, and, and they can treat it with, um, with some chemicals um, and to make sure that they're not any cancer cells in it, and then we can it back into the patient. But, um, let's see, this was a, oh, when we were talking about the, the radiation therapy part, um, we, we can do the radiation therapy um, to, to um, begin with, um, with a uh, sort of bone marrow transplant, that they can use for therapy if there's organs involved that, that need, to, be, um, that they need to, to get rid of some of the, the um, leukemia cells or the leukemia infiltration that can be, be used. But um, normal cells definitely, definitely do recur, recover um, more quickly uh, from um, radiation damage than, ab than the abnormal cells do, cancer cells, except for some places like the liver where that's, that's not the case. Um, and radiation therapy is a localized treatment and the side effects on the skin and the hair and all that kind of thing is only where the, the radiation beam is going to be or wherever the implant is being you know, close to the um, And then, excuse me, the bone marrow radiation therapy can, can um, cause decreased blood cell production and anemia from the side of the and all that sort of thing. So, Yeah, the other, the other day. All right, three types of, of the bone marrow we already, already said.
said this, they, sometimes they call that uh, identical twin isogeneic, but, but um, just know that it can be a, um, a, a matched donor or very closely matched, but it, it's usually a sibling though with a closely matched tissue antigen. But you know, they have that uh, bone marrow registry so that, that if people don't have a sibling, or don't have anybody that you can um, uh, use for a, for a donor then in, in the family, then, then um, if it's close enough match to be similar to a sibling, then that, that's what they would use. Um, and I think I already said that, that kind of thing. Yeah. And you can, uh, they, you can even use your own umbilical cord blood, especially in, in children. Um, so some families are going on and saving the umbilical cord um, blood to, to um, have those, those stem cells available so that if that child or one of their siblings um, needs it, it's a good to be able to use it. It is expensive to, to um, have it done. I think it's like $50 to have it, um, you know, saved, but then to store it, it's hundreds of dollars a month. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's several hundred dollars a month just to store it. So. But you know, I guess that's, that's one of those things that insurance is probably not going to take for that. So anyway, what what you do with the bone marrow transplant is you, you give radiation and chemotherapy to kill all the cancer cells before the transplant. It also kills the bone, the bone marrow's ability to make the normal cells. Um, the transplant risk the client if it actually is a risk in treatment um, to re reinfuse the marrow cells into the central line so that the, the stem cells can bringing graft in the marrow and resume the production of the normal cells. And actually, without that transplant, they're going to die because there's no way that they can recover. They have nothing left. They, it actually kills their, their bone marrow's capacity to make cells. It's, it's very, very strong therapy when you do it um, that way and totally, um, totally eradicate it or purge the bone marrow of any, any um, baby <coughs> cells. And it's going to purge the ability to, to um, make the, the regular normal cells. So um, the, the patient's critically ill until they, the, it re-engrafts and the, the cells start coming back. So what kind of precautions do you think we need to take? Infection. infection. Yeah, infection. And what other cells are not being produced? So bleeding precautions, exactly. So then we're going to have sore mouth, and we're going to have irritated GI tract, and probably um, urinary tract, all those mucous membranes, we you know, that have... Um, all mucous membranes do have some divine cells and everything, so it could be um, difficult in, in a whole lot of body function. So, um, anyway, I'll let y'all um, read that process kind of with the patient I was going to tell you about the patient I was going to tell you about had CML and he was 24 years old and um, that was, it was like, I took care of him for well, I saw him for a number of months. He would he'd be in the hospital sometimes with infections and all, and then um, then he'd, he'd be coming back to the clinic and he'd just come to the unit and, and say hey to us a lot of times. So he was right at my age, and um, and he he was just a really fun guy. And he he was actually a, um, a what do you call the the parachute jumper people, <laughs> whatever skydivers, and he taught that. That's what he did for a living was teach people how to skydive. And um, he, he wasn't doing well on, on just the regular therapy, and so they ended up um, doing a bone marrow transplant. They were planning a bone marrow transplant. But he went on one last jump um, before the bone marrow transplant. He was like, why are you taking a chance like that? You could get hurt or whatever. And that, that's just, you can wait till your bone marrow transplant takes, you know, we, that's what we were all telling ourselves. Why, why would you take a risk like that? Well, anyway, he. He, his brother donated the marrow to, to him, and they, they had to actually to take it out of his iliac crest. So, so they took, you know, take about a liter of bone marrow. It takes a, it's a long procedure, and it's in. They put him to sleep like they're having an operation, you know, having surgery, and um, because that's a whole lot of different punctures that they have to have, and and so it's a lot harder on the on the donor than it is on the recipient. Because his brother was all bruised up, of course, and had to have that, and he did anything for for Ed. And, so, so anyway, he he um he had to have a recovery period. He was in the hospital. Well, he was at the hospital. He had to actually keep him. But um anyway, 
that they did, um, uh, they've done all, all that chemotherapy, radiation therapy to, to purge all of his cells, and, and he, he had all those side effects we were just talking about, and, um, and, and uh, sore mouth and all that kind of thing. And then um, he, he started engrafting, and, and what I was, you know, hearing was that the flavors were coming up every day, the ODCs were coming, I didn't take care of them every day that, that I was working, but I did it for a lot of times. And, um, and then I, I was getting ready to get married, and I stopped um, working two weeks before I got married, because I, I was a girl, and so I moved back to, to Salisbury with my parents for two weeks and to get everything ready for the wedding, but I came back. So I had gone to a conference and I had to, that was one of the requirements that they pay for you to, to go to professional development or whatever. And um, so I had to I had to do a presentation. Um, and and so I, I went back to the unit and I wanted to go to go see Ed. And they went, well, didn't you hear? I'm like, what? Well, he died last week. I'm like, how could he die? with your grass and so you don't believe it. Everything was so wonderful. Well, it was his, um, his bone marrow was doing fine. It was just that he ended up with pulmonary, acute pulmonary fibrosis from all the alkaline agents and radiation together. He just ended up having an extra, extra special, I guess, a, what, a adult respiratory distress syndrome or whatever, is that what you call it, maybe? And, and uh, but he, he died from it. And it was just like, I just can't believe that. I'm, and it's just like, how in the world could we have even been busting him for doing that last jump or he would have never even made it? I got on my honeymoon, you know, I did, I feel you know, shocked and all that kind of thing. You know, I got on my honeymoon and we went to Acapulco and we were sitting there oh. and everything. And I just, I cried like all that afternoon. And I was just like, really? You want to come home with me? tough thing, but that, that can happen. It's very dangerous, and it, I mean, it has a lot of risk, and it's a lot better than it was way back then, but anyway, that's, that's just my, my sad story here. Okay, all right, and this is just a picture. That, that doesn't really tell you a whole, whole lot, and we already talked about the bone marrow biopsy thing. I had a note about that, um, too. Um, and then this is just a, note, a picture of the, the isolation kind of situation that they have for a child in, in, um, that, that had a bone marrow transplant. Until they said that the, um, they like to have the um, absolute nutrient filled pump to be like 1500 before they take them out of particular isolation. Um, and then the stem cell transplant is, is when um, it can be a kind of person that tissue if you're doing a stem cell transplant out this way. You can take it home or you can do it with somebody with a pocket. You can't totally get your reward of courage enough and feel like it's safe in there in terms of homogenate animals when somebody's just a close match. But um, what they'll do, whoever's going to donate, if, if somebody's in remission and they want to store their, their stem cells, take the, um, the, the GCSF, the new genera and or the GMCSF that has the macrophages as well, that's new genera um, and that, that helps to produce more stem cells and then release more stem cells into the, the circulation. So you don't have to actually go into the marrow if you want. You can actually do like the plasma paresis, like, like the blue at the Red Cross when you're doing like let's say that you do the, the blood column and then put the picture blood through it. Um, they are talking about, I even said in your book, that they do light transplants sometimes. It's experimental um, with some cancers because it is so dangerous to, to kill every capacity, to, all the capacity to make, make blood cells. But when they when they do the light transplants, that would, that is with a, an unrelated donor that it is a match, but not a total match. And so then actually the, the donors new cells kill um, kill some kill the cancer cells, and it is like a, um, a graft graft versus tumor sort of situation. 
And then y'all heard about, about doing cord, uh, umbilical cord blood, um, blood cell transplants. And um, it's not as, not as much as they would, would like to have. It's, it's not really enough for an adult. But sometimes they do use it as, as um, if they do one of those white ones, I guess. But that is a matched kind of thing. But, but um, I'm, I'm not really sure how they, how they figure out how to, to, to do that. But with children, it's really perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> perfect and I did think put on that note stage that, that um, some some couples who had a child with leukemia or something like that and, and where they a transplant could offer a cure or a remission or anything, that they may actually plan a pregnancy and that that actually I had, had heard of that happening before that movie came out. But what's it called my sister's keeper and then is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh really? Uh, it's, it's hard to watch after it, watch this thing. But anyway, they, people do that. They, they'll just get pregnant just just to have a donor. It's like a like an organ donor person that you're you're creating or something. And that that's what that girl was kind of Okay, graft versus host disease. Allergenic transplant. Sometimes we can diarrhea, GI bleeding, and all of that, and then the liver function is, is certainly compromised. Then um, it says the, the donor T cells are recognizing the recipient's body as non-self, which it is, because that's going to be your, your new um, um, bone marrow cells or your stem cells, and you may see the, the donors. And um, the basal disease of the liver can, um, can affect that to 25%. And you know, you had John Rejection. It's not like a, an organ. When we talk about a transplant, you think you're going to cut somebody open and put something inside. But, but with the, the bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplants, it's, it's just like blood. I mean, they filter bone fragments out of it. It was actually taken from the marrow. Um, but they, they just actually transfuse it. It's just like transfusing a process is transfusing a blood transfusion. So it's fine. Um, it's really that spectacular. Um, but the the um, myeloablation is the other word for that purging. I couldn't think of the word when I was got to the purge thing. The purging the marrow, but myeloablation is the, the actual proper. Okay, and um, this weekend, this was up from from the maternal child text. Some of this stuff from from that 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 um, the prognosis for children. And I think we saw that in, in our like, twelve on the statistics that the prognosis is better. Um, and it's certainly better for They do better if it's um, the age of onset to, to, to 10 years or infant um, blood that's greater than 10 and whether they respond rapidly to the therapy. And then the, the higher the, the WBCs are at diagnosis, the worse the prognosis is going to be. And that 10% do relapse within a year after treatment. That's really not that that bad compared to what the adults are, is it? But you still you still say, hey, you still have the children know. So and um, I think a lot of this, y'all, we've already talked about all of this. is just a sort of review of what we've already seen. Um, and then our, our um, the nursing diagnosis on the next page. And um, the plan of care, these are the outcomes that we want to see that we can have infection and that they, um, they are herbal nourished and they report their symptoms and everything when, they, when they're released. Um, and then we, we do multidisciplinary treatment. We certainly need psychosocial care, um, social work, financial counseling, and, and 
more places um, in that they do, um, they, they um, send them to, to outpatient clinic pretty quickly. They have a, a hotel, it's a hotel, it's a hotel across the but they still do that. Um, but they, it's just a special um, <coughs> number of rooms that they have in that, that hotel um, that it's just for uh, people that, that have transplants and somebody that, that, that can take them so that they don't have to be in that hospital environment the whole time. Um, and so it, it does give you less exposure to the possible acquired uh, infections and that sort of thing. And then the, um, they may have to have some, um, obviously, in play with transfusions, like an outpatient cleaning or something that they actually sleep from um, in, uh, in the hotel. Um, and let's see, we talk about that. But then some of the meds that you give for leukemic for induction, it's called it's called ARAC, A A R dash C, something aromatized, aromatized or something like that. But anyway, it, it can cause a little more consciousness problems too. So, but that really muddies the water, the water again. It's the way you've got leukemic infiltrates causing it, or whether it's a um, opioid problem, or whether it's the, um, the level of consciousness problem. Um, and I think I'm going to turn this affection thing. Um, I think a lot of this is what you, you already know. But look on, on the notes page to, about the, the A and C. And then again, I've got that. Maybe you, know, you got that on that practice problem thing. But I put it here too. Um, the, the A and C, 2,000 to 2,500, you should know risk. And, then it's going to be minimum risk for 1,000 to 2,000, water risk 500 to 1,000, and severe risk if it's less than 500 accidents. Um, and then in the protective isolation, they're saying now that it's not evidence-based, but it's still used in most facilities because it just seems to make sense to us. They just It's hard to get evidence on something like that. They don't want to put somebody in danger in just in trying to get your evidence, just like with, with um, protection from chemotherapy. Um, you don't want to actually put people in a control group where they don't put gloves and gowns and masks on when they're they're administering something dangerous or if they're preparing dangerous um, medications that you would inhale or whatever. You don't want to have a control group and that you don't really get data unless you have a control group and it's then or it's and it's just not ethical to do that and it's just probably that way with this um, um, the evidence base with the protective uh, isolation. So um, and I've got lists of all these charts with the um, infection prevention and the um, bleeding um, considerations and everything. The IM injections are just a real new so, And they usually have, they, they would have to have a central line when they're, they're um, having a transplant. So. And of course, that's the so source for infection, though, isn't it? Um, and then the, the mouth care is really, really, really important. You don't want to use peroxide unless <laughs> there's patients that have it, they think their mouth's already healed and there's not any raw tissue there and they just got a really nasty thick coating on the top of their tongue. Maybe you could use the loop um, you know, half and half peroxide and it's um, and, and some of the stuff which you want to be very cautious about being energy conservation if they're if they're tired and, and we do that with with our sickle cell right we talked about doing that and not, not exerting too much when the um, hemoglobin's really low um, and there's there's a, a chart um, about that on page 90 is what I've written down and on the the, uh, the mouth doors if there's lesions in the mouth we sometimes it can be viral it can be like herpes and all those kind of things that we've ever had you 
agriculture, they said they may give uh, they, if there's fungus, we can have the antifungals, like I talked about the epitherium. So what's another antifungal that a lot of y'all have seen in clinical before? Not that. Flu can. Flu. And you can you can do that IV too, can't you? We just don't do that often. But and, um, mm -hmm. let's see. But oh, I was going to say that we had patients that went to Baptist to have a, a moment of transplant and um, she she really wasn't in long that break. She was on our unit, um, and it was an experimental thing back then, and it had been when I was, um, you know, I was right after I got my master's, I never got a master's just a year after I graduated, so I was starting to start my master's program, and so um, they go do a lot of experimental procedures on me that I work on, and it was really, really, um, I don't want to say fun, but it was fun to get to know the patients and, and um, you know, be able to, to help them through this process. Um, and uh, of course, the ineffective protection. The ineffective protection thing is is um, is really the the well that that can go for um, for bleeding and and um, and infection and, and all of that. So. Okay, and then especially on the, um, the bleeding, this is one that we're, we're I'm using that instead of the other. There's lots of things that can be an effective protection, though. Um, but applied pressure to ejection sites, actually it said five minutes in my previous source, but Iggy says ten. And then mm -hmm. if it's an arterial puncture, like an arterial blood gas, that you need to do it for at least 15 or 20 minutes. And that is by the clock. You don't just guess at, oh, I'm sure this has been five minutes. You've got to watch your, look at your watch or watch the clock. You have to, to do it by the clock because it's so easy not to. Um, and then make sure it's still not written after that. Um, but of course, we really want to look at that level of consciousness and all that kind of thing. And all of the different systems that you can is not, And this is when constipation can be really deadly to people if they're straining with beams. I know we've I've said this a million times, but it's really the truth. You need to keep keep people's stools soft when they're in this situation and they um, don't have platelets um, and the tumor lysis syndrome we already talked about. And I, I think I'll get to this anticipatory breathing too with the well. But, but um, certainly we talk about that. But what's on the other page is really just evaluation of the other kind of stuff. The, other interventions that you've done. I wasn't sure what to do about about this this stuff, and I'm, I'm not going to read all of this to you because I really took it from the book. But there's on the notes page here. This is just a segmented neutrophil. You can see that it's it's got the, the segmented thing. But on, on the notes page, I, I went into the MDS about the myelodysplastic syndrome. I would just read read that just to just to get an idea of what they are. This is not something that's our exemplars or anything. I just want you to be be familiar, just like I want you to be somewhat familiar with the. Um, I am going to put some questions on the um, on the test about the the children's cancers, but it's mainly like what what body system or what you know like like the neuroblastoma can affect uh, sympathetic <coughs> nervous system all over all over the place, can it? And then, but like the retinoblastoma is just I mean the retinas just in the eye, right? I mean so that, so you can pretty much pinpoint that, but but just, if you have those kinds of um, um, ideas of what kinds of therapy that, that um, they can use. And actually, I looked through all of them that y'all had done, and every one of them said that you could use surgery or chemotherapy or um, radiation therapy or, or all of them. And so that, that's what I saw. Did anybody see that, there, that, we, that you don't use that? Because just skim it through, that's what I saw. And so um, I think if you, if you know what it, 
what the disease is is, um, is working on in your body, and, and then that, that helps you to know what interventions are and what the manifestations can be. What's the retinoblastoma one? It's really weird, isn't it? Who did retinoblastoma? Is anybody here with that retinoblastoma? Is that the one where, where you just, it's just, it's just white. You know, your virus is just white. And so that, it's just a, a weird, yeah. A weird thing. So, anyway, just look at the, especially the, the you know, what body system, what manifestations, and what treatment. But I think, you know, the treatment's going to be amazing. For, for all of them, you can do surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy. I can tell you that right now. So, so it's, it, it depends on um, where, the, where it hits you in the body, this or not, like with the lymphomas and that. But um, anyway, the, I just do read through these things, where we have, have the cells, because I, I just I wanted you to, to know. Um, I so said we don't, don't have the lymphoma thing, the Hodgkin's and non Hodgkin's lymphoma with the. Um, with the children's things too. So, so if you read through this and the children's thing, I think it would be, be good. And uh, you don't have to memorize anything, but just, just so you kind of know that with the, with the Hodgkins that it actually has that reed Sternberg cell. There's a particular cell that differentiates it between um, the non-Hodgkins and the Hodgkins. And the Hodgkins is very, very, very curable at early stage. And it's not necessarily in adults as curable for, for non-Hodgkins on the bone for, um, for adults especially. Um, some of the chronic, uh, it's sort of like chronic leukemia, and it, it, it's um, the way some of the lymphomas go. You can't really cure it, but it will be chronic, and you can't get a, a remission. And these are some some of those banded neutrophils in a segment. There's a segment of one of these other ones are, are still still together. They're more immature, and that's the mature one. So. Um, and multiple myeloma is the one with the plasma that causes the Swiss cheese bones. With the, I think we talked about that before with the. Um, Yes. Um, osteoclast activating factor it, it breaks down the bones and kind of makes them moth eaten looking or Swiss cheese looking. Mm -hmm. and, and we had um, ITP um, in, in the immune unit, but it was in this hematology one too, so you just want to read that through that just to be, you know, familiar. You know, I'm not the question on that test because I had it on the, on the previous one. It's just, I think it's just good to review some of this stuff. But, um, Expecting y'all to know a lot of this. This um, hemophilia, the, the big thing to know, it's, it's so complicated with that genetics. There's a little box at the top of the page where, where Iggy talks about hemophilia, but just know that it is a genetic um, absence of clotting, or clotting factors. And, and it's factor eight with, with, um, with type A and it's factor nine with type B. But, but it is, it, the main thing is that it is genetic and it's passed on from the mother to the sons, but the daughters can be carriers, and that's just so complicated, and I, that's about all I know. I can't, I, it, I think I'd have to read that whole genetics chapter over again to, to try to figure it out. But it, it is genetic, and it goes from mothers to sons, and, so, and it is a um, recessive, I mean, it is one of those that where the, if you've got it, um, if, the, if the male child has has one of those copies of the gene, then it's, um, it is, they will have the, the disease. And there's a lot of um, transfusion information, transfusion information in, in this particular chapter because it's about hematological disorders. You're going to have this stuff again. Um, so that, that is not, that's not something that we're going to, de I'm not going to in detail ask, ask you questions about or anything unless it's just a, you know, you have a transfusion and we've talked about reactions and all that and uh, um, immunity unit, but I would read it though, but because it's, it is so good and, I, and you're going to have patients all the time that are going to have transfusion and it will help you understand it a whole, whole lot better. So. I'm going to cut this off and do that other thing if I can. I hate to rush through that, but I do 